Trust you had a good weekend? <laughs> well, good. Um, Mr. Boutros, I understand that you have some uh, matters that you wish to present before closing with the plaintiff's case? Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Um, two things before we proceed to Mr. Dussault's evidentiary presentation. The first uh, relates to the plaintiff's or the proponent's announcement over the weekend that they were planning to call Frank Schubert as a witness. And we filed a, a motion to exclude Mr. Schubert's testimony on several grounds. And because of the imminence of all this, we're hoping we could take that up first thing today. The, the, um, as the court may recall on- we take this up before the plaintiffs have presented their case? Well, the, the one reason I was hoping we could, we could take it up sooner rather than later is that um, to the extent the proponents are going to put Mr. Schubert on the stand to talk about the genesis of the strategy and the campaign strategy, we think that would, number one, be a waiver of these privilege claims that were invoked over 70, at least 76 times in Mr. Schubert's deposition and which form the basis of the withholding of thousands of documents. And we think that it would be inappropriate for the proponents to have it both ways. On the one hand, blocking any inquiry. If the court were to review the deposition of Mr. Schubert, it is remarkable the, the obstruction in terms of our inquiry. Um, the, the 76 objections, instructions not to answer. Um, if if the one, one looks at page 58 through 65 of the deposition, it sort of encapsulates the degree to which our inquiry was blocked. And um, the, in terms of the, the authentic, authentication and admission of documents, which was the ostensible purpose that Mr. Cooper suggested on Friday for Mr. Schubert's testimony, we have let the other side know we have no objections on authenticity grounds. And, and in fact, we're not objecting to the, the documents they at least first identified as exhibits. So either there's no reason for him to testify or to the extent he does, they're opening up a whole new world, which we would be entitled to get documents from them so we could conduct an, an examination of him. When did you learn that Mr. Schubert uh, might be a witness? If I remember our proceedings on Friday, Mr. Cooper stated that there would be two witnesses presented by the defendants, um, both expert witnesses, Blanken. Blankenhorn? Blankenhorn and Blankenhorn Miller. Blankenhorn and uh, Miller. Uh, Schubert was not mentioned. So when did you learn that the defendants might be calling Schubert? We first learned uh, Sunday morning at about 8.30, I believe, in the morning uh, that, that Mr. Schubert would be their, their witness. Um, and and the, um, as the court will recall, Mr. Cooper did say on Friday that there might be one other witness, and the primary purpose for that witness would be to authenticate documents. So. Frankly, we were, we were, I see, so. yes, that, so, so we learned Sunday, we filed our motion last night. We did ask them, we, we let the, the proponents know that we were not going to object to the documents on authenticity grounds. They're mostly campaign documents and, and the like. And um, so we were hoping that would resolve it because, you know, we had a lot of questions for Mr. Schubert we weren't allowed to ask during his deposition. And, and they have zealously protected any meaningful inquiry into anything regarding his thinking, his state of mind, his, his strategic vision. Um, they wouldn't even let him answer questions about the article that he wrote and published uh, in many respects during his deposition. So um, that's why we would like to get that resolved because if he is going to testify, there are a number of things we would have to do and probably be ready to cross-examine him tomorrow. Who's going to feel this on the defendant side, uh, Mr. Thompson or? Uh, Ms. Moss will, with the court's permission. Moss? Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Um, first of all, we received their, their motion at about 11.30 last night. And so to the extent that the court would like a, a written response, we would ask for 24 hours to have until tomorrow. But I think the bigger point would be this may be moot. We don't know for sure that we're going to call him. It depends upon, at the close of their case, um, what evidence comes in. There is a, a variety of documents that we have not been able to agree on the admissibility of. And depending upon whether those come in and what sort of tender the plaintiffs make as to their relevance and significance, we may need to have um, a witness such as Mr. Schubert testify about, about those documents. 
and specifically those documents were ones that were ordered to be turned over following the Ninth Circuit's revision of its, its opinion regarding the First Amendment. They had been withheld. And my understanding was the court's order was if they wanted it, rather than reopening the deposition of, of Mr. Schubert or any of the other witnesses, that they were free to have called them and to have asked them questions um, on the stand. And in lieu of that, they're wanting to move into evidence a variety of documents. And any questioning that we would have of Mr. Schubert would be limited to those documents if we feel it is necessary to do so following um, whatever comes into evidence. So it's not clear that we're going to need to call him for anything more um, than authenticating documents. Um, and that may itself not have to happen if they, in fact, are going to agree that the exhibits we want to move in are, are admissible. Have you been informed uh, which documents the plaintiffs uh, intend to introduce? Y yes. Well, would that not tell you whether or not you need to call Mr. Schubert? Well, it depends upon if they actually come in and what significance plaintiffs are placing on those documents. I mean, this is maybe jumping ahead a bit, but one of the objections that we have is that many of these... Assuming that all of them come in. Okay. And isn't that the assumption that you have to make? Yes, Your Honor, but if they it depends upon if they come in, uh, just come in blank, or if they come in with, as we contend, some kind of a tender by the plaintiff as to why each of these documents that is not coming in under a sponsoring witness is what its significance is and what its specific relevance is to this case. I mean, they're moving in documents which... The evidence is what it is. Well they're going to be presumably making representations about what these documents are and we would contend that the appropriate time to know what those representations are is now what significance they're placing on some of these documents so that we can determine do we need a witness to respond to them as opposed to having to wait until their post-trial briefing when for the first time we learn that they're contending a certain document was authored by the campaign when we know it wasn't or if they're contending a document shows something that we know it does not we would have no way of knowing that if they have not questioned a witness about that or made some sort of a representation about what the specific relevance is of some of these documents these are defendants documents are they not some of them are and some of them are not. How many documents are we talking about? Um, I'm not sure. So, Mr. Dussault may know. Your Honor, that we've reached agreement on a number. I would estimate the ones that we haven't, and I've tried to put them in groups. It's probably 30 to 40 in total, and I'm trying to address them in groups so that we don't have to do it one by one. What is the source of these documents, or what are the sources of these documents? Your Honor, I, th I think I can fairly group it into three. Um, documents that were produced before depositions, some of which foundation has been laid, documents that were produced during trial, but from them and from their files, and then a couple of documents that are from websites where we've shown them the website that we get them. For example, we go on a website and see that there's a simulcast that says presented by protectmarriage.com. So we've shown them that. That's, I think, generally the, the three sources, from them during discovery, from them during trial, and the internet. <coughs> Well, are you saying that you believe the source of all 30 or 40 documents, whatever the number is, uh, is protectmarriage.com? There are a couple of documents, Your Honor, where the source itself is not protectmarriage.com, but we do have evidence that shows, for example, that protectmarriage.com was involved, funded it, reviewed drafts, um, and there's a connection that, as a course of my presentation, we will show. That's the minority of them, but there are a couple where we're showing a connection of a document that comes from another source, but they screened it in advance or were involved. And I gather that's, that category of documents is the category you're concerned about, Ms. Moss. Is that correct? That is correct. I mean, many of there, for many of these documents, we don't dispute that they were produced from the files of the proponents or protectmarriage.com, but they are not, they may, for instance, have been something that was sent in and whether it was in fact actually reviewed, whether it was authored by, paid for by Protect Marriage is very much in dispute. And whether or not we need to put on evidence about that, I think, would depend upon what tender plaintiffs are making as to what representation that document, you know, what they're claiming that document represents. And normally, if it was coming in through a sponsoring witness, they would ask those questions. It would be clear through the testimony of the witness, and we would have an opportunity then to 
on cross of that witness clarify anything we felt needed to be clarified. If the documents are just moved into the record, then we may well then need to put on a, a, a witness such as Mr. Schubert to testify about these documents to clear up any uh, issues that we, to present any facts we believe need to be fairly presented. And these are documents that they're moving in. So to say that they need additional documents beyond that, I, I, I don't think that we've waived anything. These are documents that we produced because we were ordered to do so. And they're moving them into evidence. And so I think it's perfectly appropriate for us to be able to question a witness about them, uh, about those specific documents, without you know, necessarily going beyond that into to other areas. Your Honor, if I could make one clarifying comment, and, and counsel can correct me if I'm wrong, because we're hearing this argument for the first time. They disclosed yesterday at, I think, 829 documents that they would intend to use with Mr. A.M. or P.M.? Uh, A.M. with an 830 oh. deadline. Um, <laughs> and I believe, as far as we can tell scrambling now, there's only one document in the group that we've asked them to agree to that's on the Schubert list. There are, there are many, many documents on the Schubert list, and as far as we can tell, only one of them is a document that we've asked them to agree to. So clearly they're trying to do things with Mr. Schubert that go beyond the documents that we're trying to move into that. Your Honor, the documents that we identified were ones, they were documents that we're wanting to move in evidence, not the ones that they have themselves identified. We were identifying new exhibits that we would intend to put in through him, which, I which are the public ads and statements from the campaign, which I understand them by their response to my email to say they had a, no objection to. If that was all that it was, we wouldn't need to put him on the stand. But what we don't know as of this point is what additional documents are going to come into the record. And if everything that they have identified is going to come in, then we would like the opportunity to determine whether we in fact need to, to put him on the stand and ask him about those documents. Could I add one point, Your Honor? Because last point. This is it. And this <coughs> will be my last point. The, on this question of the proponents wanting to question Mr. Schubert about the documents, we asked him in his deposition over and over about documents, including on page two of our motion, we, we quote one example. Did protectmarriage.com help to develop the content of the three simulcast rallies referred to on this page? And Mr. Dussault referenced the simulcast. Instruction not to answer. Everything we asked them about to explain documents, they blocked our inquiry. So from what Ms. Moss is saying now is that they would like to reserve the opportunity, having blocked our inquiry, to have Mr. Schubert now, for the first time on the stand, give the explanation they, they precluded us from seeking from him in his deposition. It was really quite extraordinary um, the, the way the deposition was handled. And I think it would, it, it, it's uh, really trying to have it both ways now that they, they, they're suggesting he would come up and explain these documents when they stopped him from doing it in his deposition. Thank you very Thank much you, for Ron. your presentations. I'm going to reserve on this for the moment. Um, let's see what uh, documents come in um, presented by the plaintiffs. And <clears throat> then to the extent it's necessary to deal with whether Mr. Schubert testifies or not, uh, we'll deal with that uh, in due course. I think you've well presented the issue and I've read, read your papers. Uh, but I'll consider further the issue when, when it becomes ripe. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. <clears throat> the, the next preliminary issue I'd like to um, have Mr. Boy's address. It relates to the Nathanson and Young deposition excerpts we played and the designations that uh, proponents have now made. Very well, Mr. Boyce. <coughs> Uh, subject to the resolution of certain objections that we have uh, as to uh, what will be played. Um, uh, that is, we've both designated and counter-designated to each other's um, oh. designations. We've, we've each designated and counter-designated to each yes. other's uh, deposition requests. We do have some, and, and we have here... Um, are, are these additional designations? These are additional from what we played. In other words, you, the court will recall that with respect to uh, Professors Young and Nathanson, who were experts for the defendant, the plaintiffs in their case played certain selections. 
and um, uh, because we offered into evidence the deposition, um, they were entitled to come forward with additional designations. Um, we've now agreed that what's present um, are responsive to our designations, and we've made a few additional designations for contextual purposes. So we've got all that agreed to. What we don't have agreed to is that we have certain objections to some of their uh, designations on the grounds that their, their own designations demonstrate that the witness is not competent to testify about that subject. Um, a Dauber challenge? A, a Dauber challenge. Um, uh, and it actually goes maybe even beyond Dauber in the, in the sense that... Um, Dauber plus? It, Dauber plus. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, what we've done for the court's convenience, uh, and you might begin with um, uh, Professor Young, um, what we've done for the court's convenience is we have marked here in yellow the designations that they intend to play, and we have marked in red or pink the designations that they want to play that we object to. The yellow ones are agreed to. The pink or red ones are ones that we uh, object to. Well, happily, most of these are yellow. Most of them, most of them are yellow. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, uh, we we, we uh, tried to keep our objections uh, um, uh, limited. The, um, but if, if I could uh, just ask the court maybe to skim um, some of the initial yellow pages, what you'll see is that what they have done is they have designated a whole series of questions and answers that demonstrate that Professor Young has very limited, in their view, expertise. They have established she's not an expert in psychiatry, she's not an expert in psychology, she's not an expert in sociology, um, she's not an expert in anthropology, um, she's not an expert in the field of child development, she's not an expert in political science. Um, uh, she uh, is an expert in religion, but she um, is an expert in uh, Hinduism. Um, uh, she has never done a study of, um, in the United States of whether there is bigotry or prejudice uh, against gays or homosexuals. Um, uh, she doesn't um, not question. You are familiar with Roman Catholicism, correct? Answer, it's not my area of specialization, subspecialization, which is Hinduism. Um, she uh, has never studied um, how many gays or lesbians are raising children, or what the consequences of that are. Um, uh, she's not even familiar with what the views of homosexual activity are of United States churches. Um, uh, she has not done studies um, uh, as to what proportion of children today are being raised uh, by people outside of the marriage that she describes as the norm or what proportion of children are being raised by gay parents, um, uh, or what proportion of children are being raised by single gay individuals, or um, she's not aware of studies concerning whether permitting gay marriage will increase the number of children being raised by gay couples. Um, uh, and yet... Here, Mr. Boyce, excuse me for interrupting. Yes. <clears throat> if Perhaps a way to deal with this is for me to take these in the chambers and review them and then come back and discuss them with you. And is it Mr. Patterson who's going to be dealing with this, Mr. Nielsen? I would like to address the court regarding this in terms of actually negotiating the deal. Thank you, Your Honor. I would like to address the court briefly about this, but Mr. Patterson will be negotiating with plaintiff's counsel about the details. All right. And uh, the points I would like to make are just these, that, uh, Your Honor, uh, the court did admit into evidence certain designations from, those t from the testimony of, or the depositions of Professor Young and Dr. Nathanson. And we believed that those excerpts were matters that were outside the scope of their expert report and beyond their expertise. Now, there's no question, 
And as you heard Mr. Boyce <coughs> say, there's no question that our counter designations are responsive to their designations, and they should come in under the rule of completeness. The great irony here is they're saying that they introduce designations outside of their areas of expertise, and they want to prevent us from putting in counter designations because they are also outside of their expertise, which stands to reason since they're about the same things. Now, I would say that since their stuff came in, ours should come in under the rule of completeness. And I, I would remind this court that when this came up, uh, Mr. Cooper re requested that the court take judicial notice of the expert reports of both uh, Professor Young and Dr. Nathanson so the court could see for itself what the scope of their reports were, what their areas of expertise were, so that the court could determine and could see that these statements that the plaintiffs introduced into evidence were things that plaintiffs asked about at the depositions that went well beyond anything the experts had opined about in their reports or that they had expertise in. So it's, it's a great irony here because the argument is it's our counter designations should not come in because they're outside of the area of designation, but under the rule of completeness, they're responsive to the things they play that were also outside the area of their expertise. Well, very well. I think I have uh, reasonably in mind the nubbin of the dispute, but you, it would be honor. helpful if I actually could see the testimony that you're both talking about rather than try to deal with it in the abstract. Yes. Uh, Your Honor, the only thing I would say is that we believe the yellow are responsive to what we said. We do not believe the pink is responsible to what we said, what we played. In other words, um, we did not play sections uh, that asked her to compare the result of children living in a so-called traditional uh, family, what she calls a traditional family, and a gay couple. We didn't ask them to compare those two. That's what one of the things they're doing. We agree that the yellow is responsive. We do not agree that the pink is responsive. No, and it, it does appear that the pink is relatively a small proportion yes. of what's designated. Yes. And if I could, I, that is not an objection I have heard before. The objection I have heard is foundation. And I think, Your Honor, if you uh, line up the pink as well as the yellow with what was actually put into evidence, you will see the close connection. All right. Well, that's very helpful that you've uh, highlighted uh, the passages in this fashion. And uh, I'll read these perhaps over the lunch break or this evening, and then we can talk further about, uh, about the matter. All right, any other preliminaries before we begin? Here. Your Honor, just very briefly, the defendant interveners actually have pending um, a motion to compel against several no on eight groups um, in response to some subpoenas that we filed. Um, we're happy to, to rest on our papers, but I did want to raise that because, of course, as we get into our case in chief, if the court were inclined to grant those, now it would be when we would need the documents. So I would just, I just wanted to, to raise that that is pending and um, we're not asking for argument, but we are asking for a ruling, I guess. All right, very well. Mr. Boy, uh, Mr. Uh, Dis Mr. Dassault, I gather, is going to be making the presentation. Is that correct? Yes, Your Good morning, Your Honor. I thought it might be helpful to start what we've been referring to as the evidentiary presentation this morning with just explaining to you the, the goal that we were trying to accomplish and the discussions we had with opposing counsel about it. Our goal was to try and find as expeditious and efficient a way as possible to get a limited body of exhibits into evidence, given that many of them were coming in during the trial and, and the way we've been sort of responding on the fly to some things coming in um, and also dealing with objections and other issues. Um, and I think I can put these documents into three general categories. The first was admissions by a party, and I think we've got pretty broad-based agreement there. The second is campaign messages and structure, which as you've gotten a, a brief preview, I think is the one where we have the most disagreement. And the third is a very limited group of documents that relate to witnesses who testified earlier that for whatever reason didn't come into evidence and we're going to try and get them in at this point and we've tried to reach agreement on those. Um, these are documents that we feel there really shouldn't be, number one, any legitimate dispute about their relevance to the case, about their authenticity, about the fact that they should be in evidence. We also don't feel any need questions about the documents. We just want the evidentiary record to reflect the documents and what they say. Um, 
To start with the good news, we have been able to reach agreement on a relatively large group of those documents. I believe it's 46 documents as to which uh, counsel for defendant interveners have indicated they have no objection. And I've given that compiled list to Ms. Moss, but it was the result of our discussions beginning on Thursday, and I very much appreciate the courtesy they showed in doing that. I'd like to hand this to the clerk and to the court. And, Your Honor, I would ask that the documents on this agreed-upon list be moved into evidence. Yes. Yes, sir. We have no objection, Your Honor. Very well. <clears throat> now, Your Honor, as I mentioned, the, the first group of documents was admissions by parties. And fortunately, we've had no disagreements there. There were a couple that we suggested that were not agreed upon, and we've withdrawn that. So I do have a witness binder that we prepared that reflects the documents. To the extent it's helpful to the court to have them, we can make it available. But all of these are in evidence now, and there's really no need for any further discussion of them. <coughs> Excuse me. These are what, uh, Mr. Dassault? These are the documents that uh, plaintiffs and defendant interveners have agreed or admitted and are now admitted. And they're just copies of the party admissions that we just moved into evidence. Oh, so. Perhaps I can clarify. The list that we gave you includes some documents from each of the categories I described, but all of the admissions are coming in by agreement. We just thought that the court might want to actually have copies of those documents available since we're putting them in evidence, but I'm not going to address them any further today. The next group of documents... I assume at some point you're going to take me through these and uh, tell me what it is you uh, think these documents establish. We certainly can, Your Honor, and what we were assuming is that in closing or any post-trial briefing that you may ask for, we could certainly draw from certain aspects of it. If Your Honor would prefer that we walk through certain of the admissions as part of our case, we can certainly do that. Well. The, the primary goal, Your Honor, was just to be able to have in evidence certain facts. Some of them are, are somewhat administrative, just to make sure that we're able to have authority for those as we go forward if we do additional proposed findings or briefing or closing. Well, I don't want to make uh, your presentation overly long, but uh, there are quite a number of documents here, and exactly what I'm supposed to derive from them is uh, not clear. and. Um, if you expect, uh, expect the court to draw some fact or inference or admission from these, I think at some point or other you need to tell me what it is you want me to get from these. Fair documents. enough, Your Honor, absolutely. And we, we were maybe erring on the side of, of being expeditious and since there wasn't a dispute, not trying to dwell on that. Um, perhaps what I could do, Your Honor, is to move on to the disputed subjects and All then right. we can confer about how best uh, to put that in. The next category of documents, Your Honor, the one where there's the greatest degree of, of disagreement is documents relating to the campaign and the structure of the campaign. And the first group of documents in this category is the one we talked about first thing this morning, these simulcasts. Um, there are three videos of simulcasts that we would seek to move into evidence. And those are exhibits 503, 504, and 505. 503, 504, and 505? Yes, Your Honor. And there are also correspond transcripts that show what was said in those, and those are 1867, 1868, and 506. And 1867, 1868 are certified court reporter transcripts of 503 and 504. And Exhibit 506 is a transcript that's available on iProtectMarriage.com website. So it's put out there as a transcript of that particular simulcast. Uh, Your Honor, the, these simulcasts were conducted as part of the grassroots campaign before the election. And they were shown to Mr. Prentice during his deposition. A clear foundation for moving them in was established 
Mr. Prentice, I don't think there's any dispute as to these facts. Mr. Prentice acknowledged that the simulcasts were put on by the pastor's rapid response team, uh, that they were held in one church and broadcast to a large group of churches throughout the state. Um, undisputed that protectmarriage.com provided the total funding for the simulcasts. Um, and also undisputed that the simulcasts were part of the grassroots campaign. So what you have here is activity reaching California voters before the election, paid for by the campaign. There's coordination with the campaign. So we think the foundation and the relevance as to these documents is really beyond dispute. If council would like to be heard on that issue at this point, we can do that. The other approach is there's a couple of other documents that I'd also like to move into evidence that talk about the simulcasts, and they may also resolve some questions the court may have. Um, the first of those, and can we have the exhibit binders? Are they all passed out? Okay. So we have exhibit binders presented to the court for the campaign materials. The first of these, Your Honor, that I'd like to draw your attention to is Plaintiff's Exhibit 2075. Which binder is that in? This is in the uh, campaign materials binder that we just handed up, Your Honor. In which of these binders? Uh, on the spine, Your Honor, I believe it says exhibits to be admitted relating to campaign messaging. 2075? Yes, Your Honor. Oh, I see. Here it is. Now, I, I start with exhibit 2075, Your Honor, because this is one that we've already moved into evidence, um, and there was no objection to this document becoming evidence. But I would direct Your Honor's attention, and I think we can put this one, publish this one to the screen as it's already in evidence. This document, Your Honor, is a blast email from Frank Schubert and Jeff Flint. And in the from line, it identifies them as campaign managers, protectmarriage.com, yes on eight. So it's a blast email that they send out in their official capacity running the campaign. And there's a passage four paragraphs down in the email that begins on www.protectmarriage.com. It says, you will also find information on three upcoming live video conference rallies. September 25 for pastors and church leaders, October 1 for young adults and parents, and October 19 for the entire congregation. So this document, which is in evidence, shows the, campa the campaign managers of protectmarriage.com alerting people to these upcoming rallies that had not yet occurred. <clears throat> the next document to which I'd like to direct the court's attention, which is not yet in evidence, is Plaintiff's Exhibit 421. Have that in front of you. Very well. Your Honor, Exhibit 421 is one of the ones I referred to this morning that we got from a website. It wasn't produced. Um, I did, Your Honor, in abundance of caution, check that website this morning uh, over breakfast in my hotel room to make sure it's still there. So it's publicly available as of today. Um, and. It is from a website called protectmarriagesimulcast.com. But what I would note is at the very top of the text here, it says protectmarriage.com presents. Protecting marriage. See that? Oh, I see. Right. Protectmarriage.com presents, which seems to be a rather unequivocal endorsement, contrary to some of what we're hearing from opposing counsel, that protectmarriage.com was directly behind the presentation of these rallies. I would also note, Your Honor, that what this website does is offer for sale DVDs of each of the rallies at a price of $5 a piece. And this is how we obtained them. So these DVDs are not confidential. 
They're publicly available for $5. We got them in that manner. And the very website from which we got them says that it's presented by protectmarriage.com. Well, it, there's also a reference, is there not, to, uh, for more information about Proposition 8, visit www.protectmarriage.com? There is, Your Honor. Yeah. So, Your Honor, I would move Exhibit 421 into evidence. Ms. Moss? Your Honor, this Exhibit 421, it is not a website of protectmarriage.com. It is a website created and maintained by a separate organization or, or individual. I don't know actually who maintains the website. Um, did protectmarriage.com had no control over what was put on this website and Mr. Prentice at his deposition indicated that he had never seen this and was unaware that these simulcasts were for sale. So the fact that they have pulled something off the internet um, that, you know, that suggests that these simulcasts were for sale and attempting to say that therefore somehow protectmarriage.com is responsible for this, they haven't laid that foundation. No one has testified .com maintained this website and indeed the only testimony on this from Mr. Prentice's deposition was that he was not aware of it. Um, they, the campaign does not dispute that these simulcasts were paid for with money that was raised by protectmarriage.com, but there is no evidence that they had control over the content of these simulcasts or what was said in these simulcasts. Mr. Prentice was not shown these simulcasts at his deposition, and we don't know what in these simulcasts, which are, I think, each over an hour, maybe an hour and a half long, what in them specifically the plaintiffs are contending is of relevance. Um, I also believe Mr. Prentice testified that he did not attend these simulcasts, and I'm not sure that I, my memory could be wrong on this, but I don't know that anybody from Protect Marriage was at these simulcasts. So. Um, without some further, I guess, direction or tender from plaintiffs as to what in these three, you know, hour, hour and a half long videos they contend is relevant, we're sort of at a loss for, for how to respond to this. We don't dispute that the money was paid for, but this is not Protect Marriage's website. They did not offer these simulcasts for sale. And, you know, we did not produce them and can't we don't necessarily object to the authenticity. I mean, we, we agree you can go to the website and the website is as it is, but these were not, these are not from the files at protectmarriage.com and we don't believe they've laid a foundation. So, what's the evidence here? Well, uh, Your Honor, again, it, it, I think Ms. Moss just conceded that the simulcasts are paid for by the campaign. So I think the statement that it's pre presented by protectmarriage.com is established as truth by that admission. But this is a document, Your Honor, that we've alerted them to on our exhibit list and told them Thursday was part of what we were going to move in. And as I said, the website this morning still says protectmarriage.com presents. So I, I think it's a bit odd to hear that they're somehow suggesting maybe that that's a misrepresentation when it's, it's on this website. I do have another document that might shed some light on this, if Your Honor would like to consider that one before ruling on the admissibility of this. Very well. Um, if you could look at Exhibit 2656, please. have that in front of you, Your Honor? Yes. Your Honor, uh, Exhibit 2656 is a document produced by the defendant intervenors, and it was produced during trial, as I understand, so we didn't have it at the time of depositions. Um, it's an email chain between Jim Garlow, who was one of the driving forces behind the simulcast, um, and he sends an email to Mr. Flint. But about halfway down the page, Your Honor, there's an exchange between Mr. Puno and Mr. Barlow uh, about a card relating to these events. And you see there's three points that Mr. Puno makes. The first is about a statement that says CCN is broadcasting these events at no charge. He says, if we, presumably protectmarriage.com, are paying CCN, we can't say CCN is broadcasting at no charge. We can say CCN is broadcasting the simulcast excuse me, at no charge to the participants. 
The second point is the one, Your Honor, that I think goes directly to Ms. Moss's objection. This is Mr. Puno saying, all of the CWA references need to be taken off. CWA presents should read protectmarriage.com presents. What's CWA? Concerned Women for America. So this is a postcard about the events where Mr. Puno is specifically directing that the simulcast should be described as presented by protectmarriage.com. And then the third point is also relevant, I think, to the extent defendant interveners are trying to distance themselves from this event in that it says the mass mailing must also be identified as coming from the campaign's address, not CCNs, the campaign being protectmarriage.com. So, Your Honor, I would move this exhibit, 2656, into evidence, and I believe it's further evidence that exhibit 421 should come in. Is there an objection to admitting 2656? Um, I, I guess no, there's no objection to, ad, to admitting 2656. Very I would well. simply Fif point. 2656 will be admitted. Your Honor, I'd simply point out that Mr. Puno is giving in there is referring to the card in that exhibit. And we have, we have stated that, and, I, and it was advice that was being given, because since money was going to pay for these simulcasts under the disclosure laws, these, that had to be present. The, the, that disclaimer had to be present. But that does, it does not follow that protectmarriage.com knew or authorized that these simulcast events be, be um, published on the website or that they be sold on this website. Um, again, the testimony from Mr. Prentice was he was not aware of that and that none of that money came to protectmarriage.com. And it still doesn't address the further point, which is while they may have offered money to pay for this, to the extent that they're trying to, to draw the inference that somehow this means that protectmarriage.com controlled the content of those simulcasts, that has not been established, and we don't know what in these simulcasts they're contending is relevant, or what specific significance there is about these simulcasts, which... Well, I gather there's no question that protectmarriage.com did pay for these simulcasts. That is correct, Your Honor. And those are the simulcasts that are referred to in Exhibit uh, 421? Yes, Your Honor. Very well. I think that's a sufficient basis upon which to admit 421, and it is admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. And 2656 has also been admitted? Uh, yes. Uh, 2656 is in. And one final document, Your Honor, that I'd like to admit before asking the court to admit videos and transcripts is 2655, also in your binder. Your Honor, Exhibit 2655 is a document produced by the defendant interveners to us during trial pursuant to Magistrate Judge Spiro's order. And it's an email from Tracy Berger at Skyline Church to Ron Prentice, who is the chair of protectmarriage.com. And it attaches a number of materials. The first page that follows the email is a webinar conference call agenda, first two pages. But then three pages into the attachment, Your Honor, there's a page, defendants 24257, that says satellite simulcast September 25, Thursday, 7 p.m. And to the extent there's any question about coordination of content at these simulcasts with the campaign, it's worth noting that this is a four-page agenda of the content of one of the simulcasts that's being sent to Mr. Prent before it takes place. So we would seek to exhibit 2655 into evidence. What? Your Honor, this is an email from someone outside of the camp, outside of protectmarriage.com and its executive committee to Mr. Prentice. There is, as far as I know, n no documents that they're offering that show that there was any response to this email, that Mr. Prentice ever reviewed this email or even read this email. And so I don't think that it's standing alone establishes any fact that Mr. Prentice received this email. Well, that goes to the weight of the evidence, doesn't it, rather than to its admissibility? 
And, Your Honor, if I we're not offering it for the truth of the agenda or anything like that. We're offering it to disprove some suggestion that protectmarriage.com wasn't kept apprised of what's going to happen at these simulcasts. Well, 2655 will be admitted. Thank you. I think that brings us back to the simulcasts themselves. And let me go back just to be sure from my own notes. Do I understand there is no objection to 503, 504, 505, 1867, 1868, and 506? Is that correct? Honor, our objection is, uh, is, again, our objection would be we don't believe that they have shown or offered what specific significance or relevance there are to All these. Right. To and these. and is, it is that that you're now turning? Yes, sir. All right. And, you know, I think the relevance is quite clear from what we've established, that this is paid for by protectmarriage.com, represented at Mr. Punya's request as presented by protectmarriage.com. It is messages that were communicated to California voters before the election. Uh, I think the relevance of that is, is really self-evident. We would like for the entire three simulcasts to be part of the record of this case, but what we have done is we have about six minutes of clips that we would like to present to the court. And my hope would be that we could admit the simulcasts as relevant admissible evidence and then present to you as the finder of fact portions of that that messages that were being presented to California voters at the expense of the campaign before the election as clearly relevant to the issues before the court. All right. So it is the excerpts that you are asking the court to rely upon in making its findings. Yes. Okay. So with your honor's permission, if we could play those excerpts. You may. Well, we're glad you're here. Thank you for being here at our first ever satellite simulcast in defense of marriage. We're here to protect marriage and to celebrate marriage tonight. Thank you. Thank you to all of you that are joining us. We're here in San Diego and you're all over the state of California. The polygamists are waiting in the wings. Because if a man can marry a man and a woman can marry a woman based on the fact that you have the right to marry whoever you want to marry, then the polygamists are going to use that exact same argument and they're probably going to win. And then I think about the damage done to our children and our children are going to be taught in the schools that gay marriage is not just a different type of a marriage. They're going to be taught that it's a good thing. And, of course, we're destroying the pillar of our society. Well, let's ask Tony Perkins of the Family Research Council to help us on that. He takes us across the country to Massachusetts and see what he found out occurred there when they had same-sex marriage. Tony, take it away. Well, thanks, Pastor Jim. I'm standing here in front of the United States Capitol, and I bring you greetings from Washington, D.C. What we're finding out around the country is that few families are really thinking through the implications of same-sex marriage being legalized in their states. Based on what we now know from Massachusetts and from Canada, we can say that same-sex marriage affects every family in a community, and it confuses children. We know that families find themselves in some very awkward situations when even their elementary age children come home from school having been read a book about same-sex marriage that affirms it. If same-sex marriage is legalized, then it must be taught as normal, acceptable, and moral behavior in every public school. Now, if you don't believe me, not too long ago, we went to Massachusetts to talk to families about same-sex marriage and how it was impacting their children. The beginning of 2005, our son Jacob was going into kindergarten, and he came home with a diversity book bag. And in the diversity book bag was a book entitled Who's in a Family by Robert Scutch, and that introduces children to same-sex households. Now, wait a minute, let me be clear. Your son is in kindergarten. Yes. And he was given a book about homosexuality and marriage? Yes. What, what was your first reaction when you saw this? When I saw the book, I was um, quite upset that uh, they would couch this as diversity and include it in a diversity book bag and, and not give me notification that they were going to be um, introducing this topic of homosexual relationships and homosexual behavior and 
uh, to my young five-year-old child, I was, I was um, very upset. I have the book right here. Who's in a family? It introduces children to such things as Clifford and her dad's partner, Henry. So when she would not um, acknowledge our parental rights in this area, we then went to our Judeo-Christian beliefs and our, our faith and said, well, you wish to affirm homosexuality um, to our son. You're presenting that which is sin as though it is not to our son, and we cannot allow that. Roberto, I have a question. What has it been like? Uh, was, it, was it 2003? Was that the year in which uh, same-sex marriage became legal? And what has happened in the state since then? Nothing less than a revolution, really, in terms of uh, the way homosexuality has progressed to the point that, that now we have uh, in the uh, governorship of Massachusetts a person who is absolutely in favor of uh, homosexual marriage, in favor of the whole homosexual agenda, a governor who has uh, been elected, really, uh, by the strong support of uh, the homosexual lobby. We have um, in the field of education, homosexual teaching being uh, integrated more and more into the program of the schools. Our children being taught more and more to be acceptant of uh, the homosexual agenda. We are seeing uh, the people of Massachusetts being desensitized day by day concerning uh, homosexuality and becoming more and more adjusted to the idea of uh, homosexual marriage being the law of the land and the homosexual agenda becoming more and more of a powerful element in the life of our uh, society. I want to thank you for coming on with us. This is, this is insightful because when we read the papers, they'll say nice things like, everything's wonderful, Massachusetts, people are all happy, uh, no calamities occurring, the, the sky did not fall. And we're getting a very deep, uh, sense, uh, a very different picture. The part that really gripped me that you said the most was when you said the issue of people are being desensitized. This is a generation that is losing the awareness of the difference between right and wrong. Tony, there's no way to compare the civil rights movement and the gay rights movement. You know, we live in a society in which no one wants to be called a bigot. No one wants to be seen as being intolerant and lashing out. And therefore, there's been an attempt to hijack the civil rights movement and to make it look like this is the same kind of thing, gay marriage, that we were dealing with with the blacks sitting in the back of the bus. But I'm offended at times by that comparison because I had no choice but to be black. I didn't choose to come into the world and live a deviant lifestyle. Today, we need to understand that this is just a PR gambit. And we need the church to rise up and be strong and come forth to protect the sacred right of marriage. To compare homosexuality to a civil right is to compare my skin with their sin. That's insulting, demeaning, and offensive. I believe it's even racist to compare my complexion to somebody else's uh, sin. Um, homosexuality is a choice and uh, skin color is not a choice uh, therefore there is no comparison of the two and it says in verse 20, 21 that Jesus says how long has this been happening to him he says ever since he was a kid the devil understands if I can get a kid I got him that's why they had the school the, 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 the education in kindergarten they didn't, even, they didn't even try to go to sixth grade first grade they went to kindergarten kindergarten and right now kids in kindergarten are being taught what we would call is perversion. And we sit around and let it happen. The books you saw, it's already in place. They're already being taught that. And in kindergarten, they're being taught if a little boy thinks he's a little girl, in the state of California, he is a little girl. Same-sex marriage doesn't affect me, so why should I be against it? Okay, I hear that all the time. It doesn't affect me. What's the big deal? Why are you Christians making a big deal? It's not going to change anything for you. Can I take that one? Here you go. Miles, if Proposition 8 doesn't pass, if same-sex marriage stands in California, we will see a domino effect throughout the country, and this social re-engineered of marriage will have profound implications for every single one of our lives. I think a helpful way to think about this is to compare it to 9-11, because a lot of us are asking, how does this directly affect us? Well, I wasn't directly affected by 9-11, and my guess is most of you weren't either. In the sense, I didn't know somebody who crashed a plane in the building. I didn't know somebody who was in the building. But after 9-11, the world was a fundamentally different place, and that has affected me. 
the change in the redefinition of marriage is the same type of thing. Let's talk about the orientation issue because he brought up an interesting word about orientation that, um, and you're saying really we're, 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 we have a right to marry based on gender difference not orientation, but let's say we did that. Let's say it was about orientation. What would happen? Yeah, so if, let's just say sexual orientation or sexual attractions were the basis upon which we were allowed to marry, then pedophiles would have to be allowed to marry six, seven, eight-year-olds. The man from Massachusetts who petitioned to marry his horse after marriage was instituted in Massachusetts, he'd have to be allowed to do so mothers and sons, sisters and brothers, any, any combination would have to be yeah. allowed. So, Thank you, Your Honor. This is 503. Um, these actually are excerpts. They're excerpts from two of the three uh, simulcasts, Your Honor. Which ones? Um, make sure I have the dates right. get some help from my team to make sure I don't misstate that. Uh, the excerpts that we played were from PX 504 and PX 505. Okay. But we would, Your Honor, ask to be able to move in the actual DVDs that we obtained from the website in, in total, 503, 504, and 505. Um, and the transcripts. And what we could do, Your Honor, we could, and I think we've done this with some of the other excerpts that have been played, submit later today a, a document showing where in the transcripts the excerpts come from. That would be helpful. Ms. Moss? Well, Your Honor, we maintain our objection, but I would request, if they are going to come in, that we be given copies of these excerpts so that we can determine under the rule of completeness if there's additional portions of those simulcasts that we need to be, that may need to come in, uh, to, to be played and highlighted for your honor to put these excerpts in context um, and to, to provide the full breadth. Very well. Without understanding, 504 and 505 are admitted. And, Your Honor, what we would do, we would submit the list of the excerpts as it exhibit 504A, just so that the record is clear. All right. And, Your Honor, for, for clarification, we would ask that exhibit 503 also be submitted into evidence and the transcripts, although we didn't draw video from 503, um, we think it's analogous to any other document that may be introduced into evidence and then a particular page is called to the court's attention. But it was another one of these simulcasts that's referred to in the uh, exhibits that have been admitted. Correct. 421, 2656, and 2655. Very well, 503 will be admitted on that basis. And, and just so the record's clear, the Exhibit numbers of the transcripts are 1867, 1868, and 506. And we would ask that they be admitted as well. Oh. <clears throat> Your Honor, then, with that taken care of, the next document as to which we have a disagreement relates to these simulcasts. And it's in your binder at Exhibit 2773. Your Honor, uh, Exhibit 2773 is an email exchange between Pastor Garlow and Ron Prentice of protectmarriage.com. The first portion of the exhibit is an email from Garlow to Prentice, but the second portion of the exhibit is written by Mr. Prentice, uh, who runs protectmarriage.com, and sent to Mr. Garlow and others CCing Schubert and Flint. So we would seek to move Exhibit 2773 into evidence. Your 
Honor, our objection again would be just we think that there needs to be some tender about what specifically they believe this document is showing, what relevance, it's, what relevance it has, <coughs> and so what, what sort of inferences we should be deriving from it so that we know whether or not we need to respond with evidence should we have any to respond with. Your Honor, I'm happy to do that. I had hoped to do that after moving it into evidence so that I could publish it to the screen and make it clear what I'm talking about. So if we could move it into evidence, I'd be happy to highlight the portion that we wish to draw to the court's attention. Just one other point I'd make, Your Honor, is this is a post-election document. <coughs> yes, I noticed that. Um. Your Honor, if I may, I think I can explain the relevance. It is a post-election document. And it's a post-election document in which the head of protectmarriage.com is trying very hard to make sure that these simulcasts don't get out to the public, simulcasts that happened before. And so while the email itself took place after the election, it's talking about pre-campaign messages, uh, pre-election messages in the campaign, and a concern if those are to reach a broader audience. Your point is that it goes to the control of uh, the simulcasts. It does, Your Honor. And I think it also goes to state of mind of the defendant interveners about what's contained in these simulcasts. What's contained in the simulcasts. If it would help, Your Honor, I can, I can read to you the portion I'm referring to. I just thought it might be easiest to put it on. I assume you're referring to uh, Mr. Prentice's message of the 16th of November. Yes, I am, Your Honor. And this is about a Dr. Phil show and what's going to happen on a Dr. Phil show. And what Mr. Prentice says is, we must control the message from the simulcast. Jim, I don't see how using any portion of it will not permit the show to direct the message to the religious bias. We think it's directly relevant, Your Honor, that protectmarriage.com after the election was trying to make sure that a national audience, like an audience of the Dr. Phil show, didn't learn of this religious bias, and that's Mr. Prentice's words for it, not mine. Oh, very well, 2773 will be admitted. Your Honor, the next uh, two documents that we seek to move in are videos. They're two-part videos of rallies where Mr. Prentice spoke. Again, we don't really see how there could be any dispute over this. Um, they're videos showing Mr. Prentice talking. They're pre-election videos. They're admissions that are admissible for that purpose. And we would seek to move Exhibit 390 and 391, the videos into evidence, and then to play about two, two and a half minutes of those uh, into the record before your honor once it's been admitted. Ninety and 391. Yes, yes your honor. Okay. Both videos. Boss? Yeah, it's if I'm correct that these are the videos that were shown in their entirety to Mr. Prentice at his deposition, um, which he did lay a foundation that, you know, it was him speaking and he recalled it, we don't have an objection to these videos. Very well. 390 and 391 are admitted. And, Your Honor, I would now uh, ask permission to show the excerpts from Exhibits 390 and 391. But we know that today we must win. And that's why we're so grateful <clears throat> that 2,500 pastors have come out consistently on conference calls and what they call webinars in the high-tech realm. And uh, they've come together on a monthly basis, 2,500 pastors in California. And all it took when we asked someone, uh, do you plan to vote yes, plan to vote no, or are you somewhere in the mushy middle, if they weren't a solid yes, 80% of the time, all it took was to tell them that, did you know that every public school child will be taught this? Oh, and they would flip. And that's the role that we have to play with our family, our friends, and our neighbors. We've spent thousands of dollars on research. We continue to spend thousands of dollars every week to ensure that our polling is correct. And what you're hearing 
uh, in the papers, on the news, is not by any means accurate. And we know that we have a hidden force that needs to come out. And we can win this. Tomorrow is the day that our advertising begins. In 1999, the uh, Latter-day Saints Church got involved in Proposition 22. And very few people know exactly what LDS did for Proposition 22, but with a capital S, they were significant in the battle, both in finances and in foot soldiers. And it has been uh, no less true this time around you know that in the raising of money, this, this is a battle that's going to cost a minimum of $25 million. And LDS people from across this state have been involved. And we moved forward with the initiative, and it was a group of pastors in San Diego that got angry enough to say, you know, we're going to take this on. The Catholic bishop in San Diego, three evangelical pastors in San Diego, we're going to take this on and we're going to go statewide. And so we had the title and summary, but we didn't have any money. So I called Focus on the Family and said, you guys got any money laying around? And they sent, they sent us $50,000, so we were able to print petitions. And we turned in 1.1 million petitions, thanks to the hard work of you. Thank you, Your Honor. And what we'll do as with the prior exhibit is we'll admit a, we'll present an exhibit 390A that will show the excerpts uh, that we played Very from well. that rally. <clears throat> your Honor, the, the next document to which I'd like to draw Your Honor's attention is PX21. Your Honor, uh, PX21 is a flyer produced and distributed by something called the California Family Council Foundation. You may recall the California Family Council was one of the entities that Dr. Tam said was part of the broad coalition. Um, Mr. Prentice is also the CEO of the California Family Council. Uh, I don't believe there's any dispute that this is a flyer that was distributed in an effort to persuade voters as to Proposition 8, that it was before uh, the election and put out by this organization that shares the same leader as protectmarriage.com. So this is, and I don't believe there's any dispute as to authenticity because it came from their files, uh, and I believe during trial, Your Honor. So this is something that we believe should properly be considered as part of the body of information that was before the voters. Uh, again, I think any effort to distance uh, the campaign from knowledge or control is undermined by the fact that Mr. Prentice is CEO of this organization as well. Ms. Moss. As the face of the document makes clear, it is not a protect marriage document. I don't know that there's been any testimony or evidence offered um, that this was in fact distributed. Um, it's, it came from the files of protectmarriage.com. I don't know that there's anything in evidence regarding whether this is a draft. I think that there was a dispute at the deposition about the exact date of this document. Um, Mr. Prentice's testimony, I believe as well, if I'm recalling correctly, was that some of the um, organizations listed on the document were not necessarily involved in the Prop 8 campaign. So there was a question as to, it raised a question as to whether this was a draft, whether this had been distributed. I, I'm not clear on those points, and I, don't, I think without that foundation being laid, um, it, that it should not come in as something that um, was distributed. And if it was, then I think there should be some evidence should come in with it as to who it was distributed to and who it was placed in front of. Did it go to, to voters in California, to some other group of individuals? I mean, he, Mr. Prentice is the um, head of California Family Council, but I don't believe he drafted this document. It's just something that happened to be in his files and therefore got produced. Well, again, that uh, appears to go more to the weight to be attached to the document than its admissibility. And Therefore, with uh, resolving how much weight to it, 
afford to the document, it will be admitted. PX21 is admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. And with it admitted, I'd seek to publish it on the screen to direct the Court's attention to two portions. <clears throat> on the second page of the exhibit in the left-hand column, there's a section called background or issue background. And Chris, if we can go to highlight the text that begins the goal. <clears throat> the text to which I would like to draw the Court's attention reads as follows. The goal of the homosexual community is not marriage. In fact, in countries where homosexual marriage is legal, no more than 3% of homosexuals are married. The ultimate goal is the annihilation of marriage and full legal acceptance of homosexuality. Honor, I'd also like to direct the court's attention under legislative history to this section which refers to 1999 and describes the onset of domestic partnerships as the California legislature beginning an incremental attack on marriage. <clears throat> Your Honor, the next two exhibits that I'd like to address are PX 480, which is a video and PX 2681, which is an article by the group that produced the video. As far as I understand, there's no dispute as to the authenticity of the video. Uh, the video was put out by the American Family Association, which donated, I believe, half a million dollars to the campaign. Uh, the video includes clips from Mr. Prentice which we believe would belie any claim of a lack of involvement or knowledge on the part of the campaign. And I don't believe there's any dispute that it was made available to voters before Election Day. So we would seek first to move into evidence Exhibit 480, and then, once admitted, have permission to show excerpts as we've done with the other videos. Ms. Moss? Back to the video itself, Mr. Prentice was shown this at his deposition and he did recognize himself in the video. Um, I don't know that there was any testimony or any evidence offered about where, when or where this video was made available. So to that extent, I don't think it has been established that this was, was made available um, in California to voters before the election. Um, I, I just don't know and I, I don't know that they've offered that evidence and until they do, we would object that it's not relevant. Um, it, you know, it may have been filmed at that time, but I don't know if it was made available. Um, and, and likewise, um, the, the website that talks about the video, it's a website, it is not a, a protect marriage document. Um, and we, you know, when it was, whether it was available at the time, um, I don't believe the printout shows. There's been no testimony. Talking now about 2681. Yes, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Yes, 2681. I, I don't know that there's been any testimony that that was available on the web during, during the election. Um, it is certainly something you can go to the website and pull down now, but that does not mean that there's been evidence showing that that was available during the election. And right, Honor, once again, with respect to 480, it does seem to me Ms. Moss's uh, comments really go to the weight rather than to the admissibility of it. If it shows Mr. Prentice, he is a party to the lawsuit. He was shown this video at his deposition. I think that's a sufficient basis for its admission. Now turning to 2681. Yes, Your Honor. Um, and perhaps what would make sense is perhaps with 480 admitted, we could show the excerpts of 480 and then come back to the document that talks about the video. Very well. The ruling itself was actually an effort by the homosexual community to, in essence, undo the law that was established by 61% of the people of California. That law was Proposition 22, which Californians passed overwhelmingly in 2000. The homosexual lobby in California was very active and it's only intensified over the last uh, 10 years or so. The language of Prop 22 essentially fought back. It was a statute placed into law uh, which said that only marriage between a man and a woman is valid or recognized in California. Homosexuals and those sympathetic to their demands continually challenged Proposition 22 until a number of cases from gay and lesbian couples 
finally made it to the California Supreme Court. Activists made sure the media knew what they were looking to the court to do. One concern for many Christians is the influence of a culturally triumphant homosexual movement upon children. If traditional marriage goes by the wayside, then in every public school, children will be indoctrinated with a message that is absolutely contrary to the values that their family is attempting to teach them at home. All the school districts in California are now beginning to make it mandatory to teach that it doesn't have to always be in a family, it has to be a man and a woman, it can be two women, it can be two men. Combined with the influential images coming from the media, children will face a constant onslaught of the message that homosexuality is not only something to tolerate, it's something to celebrate. Moreover, the specter of children being raised in same-sex homes also turns nature on its head. I can only imagine the confusion with two moms or two dads. I, I, I mean, who do you go to when you need to learn how to change the oil if you're a guy? Who is there? I mean, God's giving, given moms a natural instinct to mother and love. Children need the chance to have both mother love and father love, and that moms and dads, male and female, complement each other. They don't bring to a marriage and to a family the same natural set of skills and talents and abilities. They bring to children the blessing of both masculinity and femininity. If you have a boy with two moms, who's going to teach him all the dad stuff? Dads have instinctual differences. They do. They don't. They. There's just appropriateness on when to cry, when to be emotional, when to not, when to stand up, when to be the leader. In the homosexual matrix, however, instead of parents having distinctive complementary genders, the genders of both parents mirror each other, intentionally robbing them of the male and female role models that God intended children to have. <clears throat> and, Your Honor, with the court's indulgence, we would submit an Exhibit 480A that will identify the excerpts that have been played. Very well. So turning then to Exhibit 2681, Your Honor, 2681 is an article about this video by the group that made it, the American Family Association. And we acknowledge this is not a document that was produced to us by the other side, but it's a document that we obtained from a website, onenewsnow.com. It's clearly attributed at the bottom of the exhibit. I don't think there's any dispute that American Family Association made the video, and this is a website with... American Family Association or American Family Council? Leave it association, Your Honor. I'm sorry? Uh, association. Association. <coughs> What's the connection to the defendants of American Family Association? Well, we do know that they donated, I think, half a million dollars to the campaign, uh, but they... I guess the, the most direct connection for these purposes is that they were making a video during the campaign that they wanted to put out to people that included uh, Mr. Prentice, who ran the campaign, talking to voters. <clears throat> and we think, Your Honor, again, one point I'd clarify, we're not and don't need to offer this article for the truth of any matters asserted. In fact, we disagree with what they're asserting, but we think that for the people who made this video with Mr. Prentice's involvement and cooperation, to be characterizing what they're trying to communicate in the video is certainly relevant evidence. Awesome. And Your Honor, there's no evidence. Uh, there's no evidence that this was put out during the campaign, and there's no evidence that Mr. Prentice was speaking on behalf of ProtectMarriage.com. I believe he was identified in the video as the head of California Family Council. Mr. Prentice himself is not a party in this lawsuit. He is. He is only, his admissions would be those if they were, if he was speaking for the party in this lawsuit, which is protectmarriage.com. And there is no evidence that when he gave this interview to this organization that he knew what it would be used for or that this in fact became something that was available to voters um, attempting to persuade them one way or another about Proposition 8. Um, and it, this article, therefore, if they're offering the article to demonstrate that, then that is hearsay. That's an out-of-court statement offered for the truth that, of the matter asserted, which is they're asserting that some evidence in that article is proving something about this video. It, it's not clear to me that it does, but if that's what they're offering it for, it's hearsay. Your Honor, there's no doubt 
that this article was before the campaign. It's dated September 2008. And there's a reference on the second page that says, if Proposition 8 is not passed in November, it's clearly before the campaign. And this is the people who made the video making statements about the reasons that they're putting the video out. Maybe Mr. Dussault could direct me, but I don't know that this says that the video came out before the campaign, even if the article did. And again, the article may be dated 2008, but there's no evidence it was posted on the Internet at that time. Well, Your Honor, the, the video is in evidence. The question is whether an article by the people who made it talking about what they're trying to accomplish is something you should be able to consider. I mean, it was sustained, the objection. It seems to me the connection to parties in the lawsuit is sufficiently tenuous that uh, there's not a basis to admit 2681. Your Honor, then I would move on to Exhibit 2589. In the same binder. Well. Your Honor, Exhibit 21, excuse me, 2589 um, is an email from Mr. Prentice um, to a recipient who's blacked out, I believe, in the uh, interests of the protective order concerns uh, with the subject wrong again. And its attachment is called Top Proposition 8 Arguments. And this is something that was circulated in July of 2008 before the election. So it comes from Mr. Prentice uh, purporting to characterize top arguments in favor of the proposition that he's putting on the ballot and wants people to support. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. Very well. 2589 is admitted. And if we could publish 2589, particularly the top proposition eight argument. And I'd like to draw particular attention, Your Honor, to argument number 10, which reads, number 10, what gays do in their private lives does not bother me, but I do not want children exposed to. The next documents I'd seek to move in, Your Honor, it's just two documents. And what these documents do is establish a level of connection between protectmarriage.com and the National Organization for Marriage. And you may recall, Your Honor, that the National Organization for Marriage did that gathering storm uh, video that's in evidence and there was talk about the involvement or lack of involvement in the campaign. We wanted to introduce two documents that we think show a level of cooperation and coordination between protectmarriage.com and the National Organization for Marriage. The first of those is Exhibit 2597. 2597. And Exhibit 2597, Your Honor, was produced to us by the defendant intervener, so there shouldn't be any authenticity issues. It's written and sent by Mr. Prentice uh, before the election. So I don't believe there should be any issues as to the admissibility of 2597, and I'd ask that it be admitted so that I could publish the particular paragraph I wish to address. Hearing no objection, 2597 is admitted. Then on the last page of this exhibit, there's a paragraph that begins, never. <clears throat> and I'll just read this into the record, Your Honor. Never in California history has an initiative qualified without the help of paid signature gathering. This is where the cooperation of Bishop Cordelione and the San Diego Catholic community offered tremendous help. The bishop sought the help of the National Organization for Marriage, NOM, led by Maggie Gallagher, herself a Catholic, with a national reputation for her research and writing on marriage. Gallagher and NOM's executive director, Brian Brown, assisted the bishop in articulating the critical need for a constitutional marriage amendment to hundreds of donors and the National Office of the Knights of Columbus, ultimately amounting to more than $900,000 in gifts 
directed to signature gathering. The second and final document I wish to address on this subject, Your Honor, is Exhibit 2455. Okay, 455? Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, Exhibit 2455 is another document that was produced to us by defendant interveners during the trial. Um, it's a chain of emails, and the one on the first page is the one to which I'd like to draw the court's attention. It is, we believe, from Maggie Gallagher to Brian Brown, who was identified in the previous document, also to Frank Schubert of Schubert Flint with a CC to Mr. Prentice. And this is before the election. So again, we think there's no issues as to authenticity uh, or relevance. I'd move it into evidence. Hearing no objection, 2455 is admitted. Thank you. And then if we could put up on the screen, Chris, the sentence beginning, we're going. <clears throat> and this sentence appears to be written by uh, Brian Brown of National Organization of Marriage to Ms. Gallagher, and this is now shared with Mr. Schubert and to Ron Prentice. And it says, it's talking about, let me give some background here. If you see at the bottom of the email, there's a, looks like a press statement says, Hollywood stars, ACLU, pour money into anti-marriage efforts in California. And then what <coughs> Mr. Brown is saying is, we're going to need to get approval from Schubert Flint on this. The text of the agreement requires anything specific to California to get approval. Your Honor, while we didn't object to the document coming in, that specific statement itself we believe is hearsay and should not be considered as such since it is an out-of-court statement that they are offering for the truth of the matter asserted. I believe the document's already in evidence at this point. I can the document is in evidence. The question is what to make of it. Well, Your Honor, I think, I think it should be admitted as substantive evidence. But certainly, even as a matter of state of mind, if Mr. Brown from the National Organization of Marriage is under the impression that he has an agreement with protectmarriage.com where he has to run all of his messages by them, that in and of itself is, I think, probative and relevant evidence. Your Honor, that's precisely why it's not appropriate for this to come in. He's making inferences about the state of mind of an individual that's not on the stand that we can't examine as to whether that was in fact what he understood or what he intended when he wrote that statement. Um, it, it may have a totally different meaning. Um, and we don't have the context of it, and since they're moving this in without a sponsoring witness, there's no way to have that context. And so that statement itself should not be taken into evidence because it is hearsay. No, no, it's, it's not hearsay if it's state of mind. It's not offered for the truth of the matter asserted. Well, the question is how much weight to give this evidence and exactly what to make of it. Uh, it clearly is an admissible document. And this may be one of the reasons why the proponents wish to call Mr. Schubert. Very well. Your Honor, the next two documents relating to the campaign are on a related topic which has to do with sort of the breadth of the network and support that protectmarriage.com had. The first document on that point is Plaintiff's Exhibit 2660. 26. 60. 2660, Your Honor. 660, okay. And, Your Honor, again, I'm, I'm not really clear what the objection is to this document. It's written and sent by Mr. Prentice uh, before the election, and it's produced to us during the trial by the defendant interveners. So I would move the document into evidence, and then once it's in evidence, I'd like to publish a portion of it to address. Hearing no objection. <coughs> 
I'm sorry, the tender of this was you believe it shows? Our only objection to this is we weren't sure what relevance they were attaching to this document, and I'm not sure I caught what he's claiming the document purports to show. Well, it talks about having the strongest grassroots response in the history of a California initiative and goes through some of the people who make up that response. Well, it, it is a document from uh, Mr. Prentice, the chairman of uh, protectmarriage.com, and it is therefore admissible. 2660 is admitted. Publish the bold portion at the bottom. And in this message sent by Mr. Prentice, what he says, he describes his campaign as the strongest grassroots response in the history of a California initiative. He talks about the role of the evangelicals, Catholics, Latter-day Saints, Orthodox Jewish communities. And then at the bottom, references something called the Arlington Group, which is described as 60 plus organizational networks with special offerings nationally. So what we believe this document is describing is not just the religious groups, but also this entity, the Arlington Group, that brings together 60 additional organizations. And then, Your Honor, a second document on this subject is 2385. Twenty three eighty five, Your Honor, was produced to us by Mr. Swardstrom, who you may recall is one of the executive committee members who we had the dispute about the depositions and the production of documents. Uh, he, he attempted to keep his identity secret for quite some time during discovery. But when his identity was actually disclosed, we did get some documents from him. And I would draw your attention, Your Honor, to the email on the first page. It's from Catherine Snow of the Arlington Group to a number of recipients including Mr. Prentice. And we believe, Your Honor, that this email is something that's sent during the campaign, August 2008, to Mr. Prentice, um, although not produced by them, uh, is something that is properly admissible into evidence. And we would ask that it be moved in. Again, Ms. Snow's email is she is not a party, and so again, we contend this is hearsay. We don't dispute that this apparently came from Mr. Swordstrom's files, um, but the portion that they're seeking to offer in or, the, or what this, this reflects is an email from somebody outside the campaign sending it in, and it's not clear which particular statements he's pointing to, but presumably they're hearsay. Um, they're not from a party. Well, this nonetheless is a communication to Mr. Prentice, and therefore 2385 will be admitted. <coughs> and then with your Honor's permission, we would show the portion, publish the portion that refers to website. And this is, as Ms. Moss noted, this is someone from the Arlington Group talking about what they're doing here as part of this effort. And what it says is, I am organizing heavy hitters to do video clip messages to the American public to promote our efforts. Newt on board, emphasis social fabric. Requests out to Mies, plea to legal community. Levin, plea to country. Dobson, plea to Christian, com, C-O-M-M. -M. Pastor Garlow, plea to all pastors. Mike Judge slash Colin Hart, UK. Warning of what will happen if apathy sets in and what UK now faces. And the House Whip Blunt, Rep Pence, Senator Burr, for plea to elected officials. And Your Honor, I would again just note that these statements as to what the Arlington Group are supposedly doing or not doing are out of court statements being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. It hasn't even been established that these are efforts. My understanding is they were also involved in the ballot initiatives or in other states. And so to what extent this is even pertinent or applicable to, to California, I don't think has been established. And Ms. Snow, the author of this document, is not here for us to question to, to, to uh, get the context and uh, um, to cross-examine her about this statement. Well, it is a document that was 
evidently sent to Mr. Prentice. It certainly would reflect his state of mind, and therefore I think it is admissible and it's in. And Your Honor, the last document we have on the campaign messages group, I, I don't believe there will likely be any issue because this is actually one that's on their Schubert list that they intend to use. But uh, it's Exhibit 2150. And this is an actual flyer from the campaign itself that was produced by the defendant interveners to us. It seems to be clearly admissible as a campaign material, and I, I don't understand what the basis would be to object. There is no objection, and I don't know if that was on our list or if we just overlooked it. Okay. Thank you. That's Very well. 2150 is admitted. Great. Then, Your Honor, the, the last group of documents, which I think I can do very quickly, and we have a, a final set of binders on this group of documents, is documents that relate two subjects of testimony that we've already had in the trial but that are not currently in evidence that we had hoped we could just move in by agreement, but we have disagreement over. Now, Your Honor, the, the first two of these documents that we hope to admit into evidence um, are Exhibit 1675 and 1676. And these are two statements of the American Anthropological Association on the issue of race. We believe, Your Honor, there's no dispute between the parties that these are, in fact, true and correct copies of official statements of the American Anthropological Association on the subject of race. And I would submit, Your Honor, that this issue is directly relevant to this case because of an argument and a line of questioning that the other side has been making that somehow sexual orientation is some undefinable minority status, whereas the something like race is quite clear and defined. And what this document, both these documents do, is address what anthropologists recognize as the complexity of the concept of race. And we would note that that doesn't preclude protected status being afforded to members of racial minority groups. Ms. Moss. <coughs> Your Honor, I don't have down that these are on the list of what we, what was reviewed, but looking at them quickly, that was provided to us for review, but looking at them quickly now, um, we think that the court could take judicial notice of them, uh, so we wouldn't have an objection to that extent. We think that it probably would have been more appropriate for an expert to speak to them, but they, they can be taken judicial notice of, certainly. Very well. I think that's correct, and therefore... The court will take notice of 1675 and 1676. And what I'd like to do then very briefly, Your Honor, is publish Exhibit 1675 and draw the court's attention to a couple of passages. First, if we can start with the very first paragraph in the United States. <clears throat> and the two sentences to which I wanted to draw the court's attention are, in the United States, both scholars and the general public have been conditioned to view viewing human races as natural and separate divisions within the human species based on visible physical differences. With the vast expansion of scientific knowledge in this century, however, it has become clear that human populations are not unambiguous, clearly demarcated, biologically distinct groups. On the second page, if we could publish the paragraph beginning at the end. And here the American Anthropological Association says, at the end of the 20th century, we now understand that human cultural behavior is learned, conditioned into infants beginning at birth, and always subject to modification. 
No human is born with a built-in culture or language. Our temperaments, dispositions, and personalities, regardless of genetic propensities, are developed within sets of meanings and values that we call culture. Studies of infant and early childhood learning and behavior attest to the reality of our cultures informing who we are. And then finally, to the last substantive paragraph, beginning how people. <coughs> Here, the American Anthropological Association says, how people have been accepted and treated within the context of a given society or culture has a direct impact on how they perform in that society. The racial worldview was invented to assign some groups to perpetual low status while others were permitted access to privilege, power, and wealth. The tragedy in the United States has been that the policies and practices stemming from this worldview succeeded all too well in constructing unequal populations among Europeans, North Native Americans, and peoples of African descent. Given what we know about the capacity of normal humans to achieve and function within any culture, we conclude that present-day inequalities between so-called racial groups are not consequences of their biological inheritance, but products of historical and contemporary social, economic, educational, and political circumstances. Oh. Your Honor, the, the next two documents that we'd seek to move into evidence are 2566 and 2581. If we could just start with 20, why don't we start with 2581, Your Honor? And Your Honor, th these are documents that we obtained from a website called the came any papers, but each of the underlying documents can be found in the Library of Congress and is admissible evidence under the ancient records exception. Uh, and this first one is a communication to the Pride Foundation in which the Treasury is denying an application uh, for tax-exempt status to a group that seeks to further the rights of gay and lesbian people. And we would submit, Your Honor, that this document is admissible and is relevant to the issues of the history of discrimination that gay and lesbian people have faced and also to the question of relative political power. This is a document uh, from 1974? That's true. And you're characterizing this as an ancient document? <laughs> <laughs> Don't shoot the messenger, Your Honor. I think it's the rules of evidence that say 20 years or more. <laughs> Very well, Ms. Uh, Moss. Your Honor, the hearsay objection aside, um, the source of these, as he noted, is, is a website. Um, it may be that these are obtainable from the Library of Congress. I don't know. What they've given us is something that's a printout from a website. Uh, there, is, there is no way to verify. I mean, I don't know this website. They haven't put anybody up there to explain where the, you know, the, the um, uh, individual who controls this website obtain these documents. There's, so there's no way to know that they are, in fact, authentic copies of what would be in the Library of Congress. And for that reason, we would object that they, the authenticity has not been established. Would the Library of Congress maintain a document such as this? Apparently so, Your Honor. And to be clear, the underlying document, we're not suggesting that the website page, which is intended to show where we got it, is, is in the library. Well, uh, you did not obtain the IRS letter from the Library of Congress. Your Honor, uh, Mr. Olson's reminding me that we did actually, anticipating this concern, go and make sure that we could obtain it from the Library of Congress, that this document can be obtained from the Library of Congress. The copy that we had included on our exhibit list was one that we obtained from the website, but we have researched this. And perhaps what we could do, Your Honor, is admit it into evidence you know, subject to a qualification. Well, I will accept counsel's representation, and uh, on that basis, you, it probably would be well to verify uh, that, but 
what lawyers say in making factual representations to the court. Uh, the court assumes the accuracy of those statements and holds lawyers accountable. So, uh, based upon your representation that this is available from the Library of Congress, uh, the letter dated October 8, 1974, to the Pride Foundation of San Francisco from the Internal Revenue Service will be admitted. So that portion of 25, 2581 will be admitted. Thank you. And then if we could publish the letter and on the page numbered four, the paragraph beginning based on the foregoing. And what I would read at this point, Your Honor, is from the letter denying tax exempt status to the Pride Foundation. It says, based on the foregoing, we feel that your activities are advancing the unqualified and unrestricted promotion of the alleged normalcy of homosexuality. Thus, we conclude that your activities carry a serious risk of contributing to a more widespread development of homosexual tendencies among certain segments of the public and a consequent increase in the general prevalence of what is still generally regarded as deviant sexual behavior. As such, your activities are contrary to public policy and are therefore not charitable. <clears throat> and the second document, Your Honor, is Exhibit 25, excuse me, sorry, uh, 2566, Your Honor. And Exhibit 2566, Your Honor, is also from the same website, and we can also represent that it's obtainable from the Library of Congress. And I apologize for the quality of the print, especially on the first page. But what this document is, it's from the United States Civil Service Commission, and it is a document uh, written in 1966 um, explaining the government's policy against having gay or lesbian individuals employed uh, in civil service. And we would move the document into evidence under the same terms and reasoning as the prior document. Based on your representation that this is a document to be found in the archives of the Library of Congress and is therefore an official government uh, record, 2566 will be admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, Your Honor, the final group of documents that I have to address is a larger number, but it... Is there any particular portion of uh, the uh, United States Civil Service Commission uh, letter dated February 25, 1966, that you wish to draw the Court's attention to? Yes, Your Honor. Give me one moment. And what is being admitted in 2566, as with 2581, is simply the government letter rather than the uh, how many papers portion of the documents or portions. Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, on, and again, I apologize for the, the quality of the copy, on page two of the exhibit of particular note is where in explaining the policy, the author talks about considerations that encompass the types of deviant sexual behavior engaged in, whether isolated, intermittent, or continuing acts, the age of the particular participants, the extent of promiscuity, the aggressive and persistent character of the individual's participation. The Voice up. Oh, thank you, sorry. I'm looking very closely at the page. The recency of the incidents and then it goes on here, Your Honor. But the, what I think is particularly noteworthy in this document is it essentially justifies the policy by denying the concept of a homosexual as a person or individual and rather focuses on the conduct as a justification and says because this is talking about conduct, uh, it's a sufficient basis to exclude people from working for the government. Very well. Your Honor, the final category of documents I seek to move in is a slightly larger number, and I thought what might be helpful is to describe generally what it is. It's 
a couple of groups of data that we believe are relevant to understanding some of the testimony, particularly for Pro Professor Badgett and some of the questions that she was asked about Europe and other areas. You may recall, Your Honor, that um, counsel for the defendant interveners brought in and cross data from Europe that we hadn't seen or hadn't been disclosed to us before because they don't have to disclose their cross documents and asked some questions about those things. And what we have done is collected some additional data that we think would be helpful to have in the record so that when we're arguing from the testimony of the experts, the actual underlying data is also part of the record. So plaintiff's exhibits 2823 through 2829 in your binder. Your Honor, are examples of data from Europe coming from something called Statistics Netherlands, which is, I believe, the exact same source that the defendant interveners relied on for their cross-examination. And this is simply additional data that we think would be helpful to have in the record. So I would seek to move into evidence plaintiff's exhibits 2823 through plaintiff's exhibit 2829. Represent that these came from the official uh, website of the government of the Netherlands? Uh, yes, sir. Boss? <coughs> Trying to find which exhibit it is, Your Honor. I think we have no objection to most of these, but I believe there is one exhibit, and I believe it is 2829 that deals with um, birth rates, or maybe it was non-parental birth rates. That was not something I think that was introduced with with Dr. Badgett, and so I don't think it's appropriate. It, it doesn't go to um, anything that she testified to. The marriage statistics um, are. We, we don't have an objection to the marriage and partnership registration statistics. Your Honor, I'm seeking help from my team to see if we can figure out which is the birth rate. Birth rate is 2829, it appears. 3829. Okay, okay. And, and Your Honor, we believe that the defendant interveners did in fact raise the issue of non-marital birth rates in the cross-examination. I believe that is correct. And there being no objection to 20, 2823 through 2828, they are admitted. And to the extent there's an objection to 2829, it is overruled. And 2829 is admitted. These do appear to be uh, government statistics. Thank you, Your Honor. And then. Two other documents of data I don't think we'll need to spend much time on because they're from the defendant intervener's uh, exhibit list. DIX 1836 and DIX 2627. DI oh, I'm sorry, it's DIX. Yes, at the end, Your Honor. 1836 and 2627 are the last two tabs in your binder. And again, this is data about divorce rates in EU. I countries. have uh, in the binder 1836, but 26. You do not have 2627 in the binder? Is that, is that a PX, 2627, or a DIX? one moment I might be able to, to the to the extent it was omitted from the binders we've handed out that was inadvertent I can show it to Ms. Moss and pass a copy up to your honor very well yes 2627 have no objection to these exhibits, Your Honor. Well, that would appear to solve that problem. <laughs> Very well. 
Um, and, well. Your Honor, th the final documents in this category are Plaintiff's Exhibit 2345 and 2346. 25. 2345. And? And 2346. And these, Your Honor, are documents from the Center for Disease Control, national data regarding health statistics, 2345 pertaining to national marriage and divorce rate trends from 2000 to 2007, and 2346, marriage rates by state, 1990, 1995, and 1999 through 2007. And again, Your Honor, I think the issue of marriage and divorce rates uh, is data that's relevant to the issues we're talking about given some of the arguments that defendant interveners are making. <clears throat> we would say we, we think it would be appropriate for the court to take judicial notice of these. These are? Uh, governmental records, Your Honor, I yeah, think. They are governmental records, and therefore I think they are admissible. Uh, but so, Your Honor, that concludes my presentation. If I could make two final notes. One is, oh wait. One, <laughs> as someone said earlier, plus whatever's on this note that I was just talking about. <laughs> um, there, there's one issue that I wanted to raise, Your Honor, which is that we received for the first time about 100 additional documents last night at 1130. Um, we haven't had a chance to look at whether there's anything in that that we want to move in, and I didn't want to upset what order I did have in this presentation by trying to deal with that. So we would certainly reserve any right we may have as to those very late produced documents. Um, lastly, it appears there may be one document that I may need to clear up, and also Your Honor had asked for some direction about the admissions. If perhaps we could take our morning break and I could come back and close that loop, I'll be done. A good idea. We'll take until... Uh Five minutes of uh, the hour. Thank you, Your Honor.